Good morning, everybody. Uh, we would like to welcome you all to the first in our new uh, web series here, uh, GSBA Rapid Response, giving you the opportunity to ask questions uh, with live answers. Uh, today, we will focus on issues uh, relating to small business um, or personal challenges stemming from the economic shock uh, from COVID-19. Um, our immediate feedback today will come from our dedicated GSBA member, um, Integrity Law Group. My name is Joey Chapman. Uh, I go by the pronouns he, him, his, um, and I am the membership development manager for GSBA and will be today's rapid response moderator. Along with me, uh, GSBA uh, staff members are tuning in, um, but joining today on mic uh, will be Terea Miller. Uh, Terea uses she, her, hers pronouns um, and is GSBA's membership and programs manager. So like many of you, GSBA is following Governor Inslee's stay home, stay healthy order. Um, our staff members are participating uh, physical distancing, working remotely while staying socially connected, uh, meeting our members' needs with our up-to-date uh, GSBA COVID-19 emergency resource page, and now uh, GSBA's rapid response. So how will today's uh, rapid response work for you? Um, this format uh, on our virtual meeting will be sort of structurally organic, um, allowing you to engage uh, with our professionals uh, with questions in the wake of the, the COVID-19. Uh, we are on Zoom, so at the bottom of your screens, you should all be able to locate um, the little chat button box. Um, definitely feel free to utilize that uh, during our hour today. Um, there will be a scenario portion coming up soon uh, when the guest speakers are speaking. Um, feel free to uh, go ahead and type in any questions you may have. Um, Terea will be following along um, and will interject um, if uh, the question should be addressed at that time um, or perhaps later on during our actual uh, Q&A. Um, so today uh, we would like to go ahead and actually welcome our two special guests uh, from Integrity Law Group, um, Principal Attorney Justin Minchkin and Attorney Jacob Clothy. Um, thank you both for coming and joining us today. Um, we'd love to go ahead and give you both just a moment to be able to Give a little bit of background and, and introduce yourselves. Um, Justin, if you'd like to go first. Yes, my name is Justin Mishkin. Uh, I am one of the principal attorneys at ILG. Uh, we founded this firm in 2009. Uh, our primary focus at that particular point was insolvency work and immigration. Um, we've since expanded our practice, um, but in 2009 was, as everybody knows, that was sort of the downturn of the economy. Um, and we were doing a lot of chapter sevens, 13s, 11s, dealing with small businesses and individuals um, and trying to help them make the tough decision on, on what the next steps were, on whether it was an insolvency route or was some other route. Um, and we're starting to see that again. So it was sort of a downturn um, in a lot of the insolvency work um, and the negotiations with creditors. And over the last six months um, to when COVID hit, um, it's, it's definitely struck up again. And we've been petitioning for a lot of receiverships um, and then discussing with businesses uh, their outlook and what we can do for them um, and either trying to help them form a plan to stay in business um, or to gracefully dissolve those in those businesses. And hi, I'm Jake Flothy. I started out with ILG in the, um, 2011. And so at that time, we were doing a lot of the, the newer um, kind of implementing new processes to help debtors. Uh, a lot of short sales, loan modifications, workout plans with both um, individuals and businesses. And, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. And I think that this, this COVID thing is going to blow over in a couple months and we'll be back to business as usual. Um, but in the event that doesn't happen or it takes a little bit longer, you know, we're pretty well versed in both personal and business um, debtor situations and helping debtors resolve those and either continue on or, you know, fold up the business and start doing something new. It's still really good to hear the word optimism. So I think we all <laughs> want to make sure that we are staying optimistic. You know, it's definitely a, a, a curious time that we're all living in right now. Um, so I know that a lot of our members are going to have questions and concerns. So um, we definitely appreciate both being here today to be able to, to assist and, and kind of give specific strategies to be able to, to help um, our, our, our members of GSBA. Um, what I'd like to do right now is just go through a few scenarios that we've actually um, put together or, or have heard from some of our members, um, put those forth to you, um, let you both kind of bounce off uh, different ideas uh, that may come up. Um, and then once we go through those, um, we'll definitely open it up for more additional uh, 
Q&A from um, the folks uh, participating today. Uh, so our first scenario, uh, scenario question is, I own a small business, just laid off my staff, and I've shut down our doors. Uh, what should I do next? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it's, it's, what are the goals? Are the goals to start the business back up again? Are the goals to really sort of just dissolve this entity, work with creditors? Um, and then we'll have to look at what are some of the personal liabilities? Because not only do small businesses have business debts, um, but a lot of times those business debts are also guaranteed by the individual. Um, for example, leases, a lot of times we'll go ahead and, and force guarantees. There'll be some tax debts, um, whether it's federal or local, um, that there may be some personal liabilities on. Um, and then some of the employee issues. So we'd first discuss, you know, what is it? What is your future plans with this business? And if the plans are truly just to walk away and be done with it, then we have to analyze what is the best option. Um, and those options are, they range from all over the board. Um, it could be a receivership, uh, which is sort of a liquidation process, not through a bankruptcy court. Um, it's a lot less money, uh, definitely quicker uh, to go through the whole process. And there's not, not as much oversight. There's bankruptcy options that are available, um, whether it be a chapter 11 where you're trying to reorganize or whether it's a seven where you're, you're simply just trying to um, shut down the business uh, in sort of a graceful manner where you put your hands up and you don't have to worry too much about the shutting down of that business and being a part of it. Um, there is just dissolving the business. And so we could go through like operating agreements or the, or the membership agreements that they have and make the determination on what they have to do to be able to go through the process of shutting down the business, whether they need to get votes or whether there needs to be resolutions. Um, and then we would start discussing the options with them and discussing, you know, how we would deal with a landlord or how we would deal with a tax entity or how we would deal with a vendor. Um, a lot of times uh, individual business owners also put their own money into the business or they'll cash out the retirements to fund their business. And so we hope to be able to talk to these people prior to doing that. Um, 401ks and IRAs and things like that. I mean, they can definitely pull from, and I think the, um, the CARES Act, I think it eliminates some of the tax implications of pulling from those. However, if possible, we typically tell our clients, don't, don't pull from those. Those are yours. Those are exempt most of the time. Um, they are protected for you so that society doesn't have to hopefully take care of you later in life um, when you are ready to retire. So we would talk about those things. We would talk about how to have the communications with the employees, um, you know, how to have all of the other hard communications that you have with maybe friends or family that have loaned you business and where they would be on the priority scheme of getting paid. Um, Jake, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think so kind of um, twisting, twisting the question a little bit. So you know, it starts off with the premise that you've already laid off employees and that you're in the process of shutting down. And, you know, some people may have already done that and some people may be thinking of that. And just kind of my recommendation and advice would be to take a step back. And again, this is me being, being optimistic, but just take a step back and kind of track and see how your business was, you know, a year ago, several months ago, and you know what the health of it was then and versus just in the you know the finite past of, of two or three months ago um, because things are rapidly changing and with the cares act um, that was just implemented you know there's new um, disaster loan options that are available and you can get a loan um, that covers up to two and a half months of your payroll expenses and the, the amounts that are pay, actually spent to, on payroll or on mortgages or, or leases related to the business or um, you know, interest payments related to the business, those could be forgiven. Um, and this is just, it's rapidly changing. So you know, my advice would be don't, don't just throw in the towel um, because you're feeling a, a little bit down and you know, sales are down and, and things are really tough. Um, don't just call it quits without giving it a full evaluation and really thinking about it and maybe even giving it some time. Um, you know, cause we're all like to say, we're all in this together and this, this cares act came out quickly. And if the situation is protracted, you know, I could really see there being additional help and additional debt forgiveness. And, um, the mayor of Seattle, um, you know, she stopped the uh, evictions on small, even small businesses. So, 
you, you don't have to call it quits right now. It's take a look at it and then, you know, like make the plan. If it is something that you, you're making an informed decision to, to call it quits, to wrap, wind things up, um, that is something that we can definitely help you with. And there are, are multiple, multiple avenues in which to do that. And there's more than just the CARES Act. So like Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook, um, they also have a lot of grants that are out there too that these businesses can apply for. Um, and we've, we've helped some of our small businesses. I mean, they don't have the time to do it. So we've helped them go online and apply for these things <clears throat> and create it. Even though they're, the landlords may not be able to evict right now, we still want to have a, a good relationship with those landlords. So not just, hey, I, I'm not paying rent because I'm not going to be evicted, but hey, I can't pay rent right now. We know the laws, regardless of that, let's work on a plan to defer these things out or to forgive some of these rental periods. Because we know that the landlords also have a lot of times mortgages and things that they're going to take care of. And these leases are going to be have to be renewed one day. And so we want to still create a good relationship with those landlords and vendors and, and, and others, uh, other creditors out there. Yeah. And, um, you know, touching on that, there might be interesting clauses in the lease. Um, typically, there's a force, what's called a force majeure um, clause which covers acts of God or civil unrest and, you know, different leases deal with those differently, but there might be a way to have an abatement of rent or at least postpone when it becomes due. Sure. And then insurances too. I found that some business insurances <clears throat> will cover these others will not. So, you know, one of the first steps I always say is, well, do you have business insurance? Great. Let's look at your policy and let's see if something is covered for your lost wages. So it looks like uh, in the midst of, of that, I, what I heard was definitely pause, take a breath, um, pay attention to what's happening so you can take full advantage of, of all the opportunities that are there um, and to communicate, make sure that you're staying communicating with your team and your people and the, even the people in the city. So um, it's very uh, informative information there. Um, I wanted to jump ahead. We have a few different scenarios, but somebody just asked a question uh, in our Q&A um, that kind of touched bases on, on, on our third scenario. Um, Trey, if you wanted to go ahead and just read that question that just popped up, um, looks like it was from uh, Susan. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how to handle commercial rent payments right now? Uh, Susan explained that she had relief from our, her landlords, but got a pretty bad offer, basically still paying them um, everything just to laying 50% off. And then they added lots of other writers that are uh, what could be considered unfriendly to uh, her situation. Okay. Jake, why don't you discuss just sort of the basics of the, the leases and the answer to that, and then we can talk about how we can work with landlords as well. Okay. So I guess the kind of the, the gray answer that's not going to be very helpful is it really depends. It's, um, you know, leases are our contracts and can't really give just a general answer about a, a random contract that we haven't seen. So that, that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, could you please clarify though the current situation? Did you just renew a lease with the landlord or did they offer an addendum to an existing lease? Uh, unsure at this time, I, I will wait to see if we receive more information regarding that. In fact, we realized uh, Susan had indicated that she had received an addendum to an existing lease. Okay, so I would say that's, a, that's definitely a positive sign that shows that the, the current landlord is willing to work with the tenant. And that's a good sign. It's, you know, when somebody makes an offer, they're typically willing to negotiate and entertain counter offers or, or alternate terms. So now would be a good time to just keep that dialogue going with the landlord and, and discussing things with them. Um, again, depending on where exactly this, this place is, if it's within the city limits, um, you know, then there might be additional protections there um, that the city imposes upon the landlord regarding evictions or collection of debt at this time. So, if you wanted to meet with us or, or if you have existing counsel and you meet with them or a broker that negotiated the lease with, for you originally, I'd say, um, you know, get a small group together and you can do it on the phone or via um, Zoom like this or even in person uh, potentially, but get a plan and just keep that dialogue going with the landlord. It seems like they're willing to work with you. 
and I'll piggyback on that. A lot of times our clients are the ones that have to go to the landlord and say, hey, can I get some abatement? Or I'm not going to be able to pay rent this month. Can we push this out or can we extend the lease? So I, I know the terms, it sounds like she's not, they're not very happy with the terms however having the landlord reach out to them and say look this is what i'm going to do it's it's a positive i agree with jake it's a positive and then it's just a it's just an offer and then make some counter proposals and depending on where where they are located there may be more protections as well like jake was saying and uh, i'm sorry one one of the things though that also makes kind of ways in in your favor maybe not on specifically on the legal side but just as a practical point is kind of at this time, there's not a high demand to enter into leases. Right. So the landlord has somewhat lower motivation to really start pushing you out of the space. Good point. Wonderful. Um, let's go ahead and jump back into our, uh, our scenario questions. Um, one of our initial scenarios that was brought up uh, was, what personal and business payments should I prioritize right now? I know that we're all juggling not only just uh, our work and our, our business life, um, but our personal lives as well. Yeah, and I guess that's gonna depend on what the goals are of the particular business that, that, that is coming to us and asking us these questions. If it's, I wanna try to continue with this business and I wanna try to work with it, I'd say, let's explore the CARES Act, let's explore some of these grants. However, if they have a set amount of money um, and they wanna continue with their business, their employees, depending on the business that they have, may not be the most important at this particular point. Um, a lot of companies are laying off employees. Again, the CARES Act, I think, would take care of a lot of that, but are laying off employees that are not essential. Um, like we have a lot of clients that say have a dry cleaning business and nobody's getting their clothes dry cleaned right now. So what are we prioritizing? We're typically prioritizing if they want to stay in business, the lease, right? Negotiate with the landlord, pay the lease. Um, there's a lot of these companies, these small companies that have merchant credits. And so then we're reaching out to these merchant creditors that automatically take funds from their bank accounts on a daily, weekly, or, or monthly basis. Um, and we're putting a pause to those. And I have found they are all pretty receptive to this. I haven't really had at this particular point, whether it's a mortgage company, a creditor, a tax entity, the Department of Revenue, I, I really haven't had much pushback. And we've been able to get a lot of these things pushed out 60 to 90 days pretty easily. Um, but again, if you have a business and it depends on the type of business and they want to continue with that business, we're going to focus on what do you have to have to make sure that your business can run, whether that's a vendor, whether that's the landlord that's paying them rent, whether it's insurances, um, and then we're cutting back on other things. If, as opposed to that, it's sort of the first scenario and, hey, who do I pay? I'm going out of business. Um, then we would again look at, we would do some insolvency tests for the business and for the individuals. We'd explore the other options, again, such as bankruptcy, receiverships, et cetera, and see what they want to do. Um, and then sort of prioritize it based on the priorities that are set forth in the bankruptcy code and the receivership statutes. But also, what is my the individual that owns the business, what are they going to be liable for when this is all done? So hypothetically, the business folds, um, what is the individual going to be liable on? And we may prioritize those differently. Um, but again, we have to know quite a bit more on what their, their individual goals are, goals are with the business. And I would say number one um, payment to make, make sure that you pay insurance. Yes. Insurance, yes. Um, whether it's, you know, for a vehicle or whether it's business, home, um, life insurance, health insurance, just make sure that you pay all the insurance. That's number one. Um, and then, and then go from there. Now, I, I did read, I got an email from the insurance commissioner, um, and I haven't read the whole thing, but it talked about, I think right now, insurance companies, and, I, and I'll have to go back and double check this, but I know at least for like our malpractice insurance, they're not able to cancel it right now if you don't get your renewals and then pay them. And I don't know what the extension was, but I think it was sometime in June. And I think they're doing the same thing with a lot of the other insurances um, to provide some relief. But again, you need to double check that before you stop making those payments. Prioritize. Got it. Um, perfect. Uh, so what we would like to do now is go ahead and, and, and open the room for additional uh, Q&A. Uh, definitely use, utilizing the chat feature. I know a few things have been coming through. So um, as we continue on uh, with our time, um, all of our guests, please feel free to continue to, to type in your questions or your comments. Uh, we are making sure that we're looking at those um, so we can address them the best we can. Uh, Terea, have there been any additional uh, questions or, or comments we should, we should jump into? 
Yes, we had a couple of follow-up questions. The first one was to the first section, and what if you had a personal guarantee? Okay, perfect. Um, and again, we would discuss, so they're shutting the doors, right? Let's go with that hypothetical scenario, and there's a personal guarantee. Um, again, we're going to look at what is now the individual's goal. So if there's a personal guarantee, business is closing and shutting down, um, how are we going to get that paid off um, or at least released? Um, and it's really going to depend. Um, so different creditors treat them differently. Like SBAs, typically if a business is shut down, we can do like an offer and compromise or with the IRS, we can do an offer and compromise um, and it may be pennies on the dollar. But hypothetically, there's a lease because that's the typical scenario that there's a personal guarantee on um, and you move out and you breach your lease. Um, you could try to do a payoff with the landlord. So sometimes they will accept um, early termination payoffs. So we'd have to look at that lease again because each lease is a little bit different. Or they can explore a personal bankruptcy. Um, so hypothetically, there's quite a few uh, personal guarantees. The business is shut down. We're not too worried about that anymore. Now we have to explore the individual. And again, it's what are you going to do after this? Is a bankruptcy an option for you? Um, in some industries, it's not. So if, if somebody wants to be, say, like a loan officer or in the financial industry, a bankruptcy may affect um, the positions that they, that they can get in the future. Uh, typically, bankruptcies, an employer can't discriminate based on bankruptcies, but there is always exceptions to that. So we would, we would have to know what that individual wants to do thereafter. So the typical scenario is settlements. So we settle with those creditors, um, try to get releases of those guarantees, um, or it's going to be some sort of a bankruptcy. To go back, though, to the business, if, if we're doing, like, say, a receivership in the business, we've had a lot of success through receiverships and also releasing personal guarantees. So that is an option. Typically, if you file a bankruptcy for the business, we're not seeing, for whatever reason, we're not seeing the same sort of releases. They will still go after the individual, typically, and then we will have to also file some sort of a bankruptcy for the individual. Um, but there's always negotiation options. We, we would typically start with that. And um, just to, to touch on that, though, is um, back in the, the first section, Joey, you asked about um, you know, just shutting, you've already laid off people. And um, not to be a cheerleader for the, for the CARES Act or anything, but it does have a provision that would still allow for the loan forgiveness um, if you rehired. Mm -hmm. So it might, might, might not be too late to like sort of Switch unpull gears. the trigger, so to speak. Um, but you can get that money, use it to pay the rent, to you know, cover your butt for the personal guarantee, um, pot potentially, um, and then reevaluate in a couple months. So, so you know, go ahead. Oh, uh, so I was just gonna say. So again, you know, my advice would be to just take a step back and you know, take a couple of breaths. We've got some time to look at everything and really analyze analyze it um, before doing something that there is no turning back from. But we do have clients, Joey. Sorry, we do have clients though, and the clients are like, "Look, I'm done. I've thought about this. I've talked to my accountant. I just can't do it." And then that's when we get into these answers of, yes, let's see what the next best step is for you. Let's help you shut down the business. Let's help you get some releases from those guarantees or discharge them. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that happens even when the economy is great. And, sure. that, you know, it's not cold or flu season. We, it happens on a regular basis. So definitely connecting with, with timing, um, a question that came through was, you know, at one point is a good idea to consult with a lawyer and, and how does one find one or to, to hire one? Yeah, so I, I, I always say, hey, and it's better to be proactive than reactive. Um, unfortunately, as attorneys, people come to us when they're being reactive, um, typically anyway. Um, I have, over the last three to four years, had a lot more proactive clients. I feel that our clients are getting more and more proactive as the years go on. However, something like this, nobody could have predicted, right? And so now everybody's being reactive. And so I would say, I would say immediately. I would say immediately when they say, hey, look, I may have to shut my doors or I need to hit the pause button. That's when you talk to an attorney. You bring in your accountants as well. So the accountants can also help you prepare the books and everything, your P&Ls and balance statements and everything. Because as an attorney, we want to see that. And we, we can't help you. We've seen thousands upon thousands of P&Ls and balance statements, but I can't prepare those for you. And we're not going to do it. We're going to ask you to have your accountant bookkeeper do it um, so that we can rely on that information and, and help you make a decision. How do you find an attorney is the second part of that question. Um, you can go to the KCBA, um, King County Bar Association.org. You can go to the WSBA, WSBA.org. You can simply Google 
um, some insolvency attorneys or bankruptcy attorneys or business transaction attorneys. Um, those are going to be the sort of attorneys that you're real estate attorneys that you're going to probably want to look for. Obviously, we can help, but there is a large community of attorneys out there that can help. And I would say, as for location, it's really going to depend on where the business is. So here in Seattle, you might want to find a Seattle attorney, right? If you're over in, in Bellevue, um, a Seattle attorney is going to be just fine. But sometimes finding a local attorney over in Bellevue may be more beneficial for you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think now is the time. Uh, if you know they continue to wait um, and there's less and less money and there's more and more debt racking up and maybe they didn't take advantage of the CARES Act or some of these other grants, it's just going to get harder and harder to make an informed decision. And um, to kind of jump on that, I, I think it's, it's never too early. Like, let's ignore, ignore COVID um, and look, let's just assume that we're talking six months ago. If you're thinking, oh, I wonder if I should talk to a lawyer, it's like the answer is yes. Yes, you should. Um, just go over anything, whether it's your your current lease, whether it's you're thinking about moving or or extending the lease where you're at. If you have standard form contracts, um, if you have accounts receivable, accounts payable, anything, um, it's just kind of treat it like like going to the doctor. You know, go go in for your checkup. You know, one once every so often and just see, um, build that relationship. You can just sit down for a, a consultation with somebody, figure out whether or not you like them. Um, if you don't like them, then you know, next time I'll, I'll try it with somebody else, talk to somebody else. And that way, if you actually get into a pinch, you have somebody that you already have an established relationship with that you trust and it makes it a lot easier to, to move forward and, and get through the tough times. I mean, we have a lot of lot of business clients that just have us on retainer and have other offices on retainer. And it's like, look, I have a question. Sure, I have an answer for you. Shoot me an email. Um, we are really accessible via email, telephone call, conferences, Zoom conferences, whatever it may be. But a lot of other offices are as well. So like Jake's saying, build that relationship early. Um, the, the second somebody starts a business, they should have had an attorney already helping them. Uh, I know anybody can go to the Secretary of State and register a business. But then after that, it's you're going online and you're getting forms and these forms are pretty general. Um, and we, you know, attorneys like to tailor something. We're going to have a lot of generalities in there, but we're also going to tailor it to that particular client. So yes, it's never too early. Um, we have clients right now still buying businesses and negotiating leases. We have one of our clients that owns a bunch of restaurants that's opening two new restaurants. I mean, he's paying over a million dollars for these two restaurants right now as we speak with COVID going on because he pre-planned, right? He talked to us ahead of time. He started to negotiate the stuff. He's getting better terms on leases. So people are still doing business. Um, but yeah, having that communication stream with, with a good attorney that works well um, with that particular person is going to be good. There's clients, um, there's potential clients that come to our office that we don't feel are good fits for us. We want to have a good fit both ways. So not only does that potential client want to have a good fit with the attorney, but the attorney also has to have a good fit with that client. That optimism with that strong forward thinking uh, in mind already. Uh, Terea, we touched base a little bit uh, about the uh, CARES relief package. Have there any questions that have come up uh, since we touched base on that? Yes, any insight as to when we can start applying for the CARES relief, uh, specifically the Payroll Protection Act and where should um, we apply? And if online via SBA or do we apply through our bank? What would be the best option? Yeah, so I've, I've had a lot of clients ask those questions already. And the GSBA has some really, really good links on its website. So you guys have done an excellent job already with that. My understanding is, and I don't want to be quoted on this, but my understanding is Wednesday would be, I think, when you can start to do the process for the employment relief anyway. I know with the SBAs, people are already trying to do it and they're waiting on hold for hours and nothing is going through, but there's e easy links and portals. The Department of Commerce has one. Um, and sorry guys, I did promise you some links. I did not get those over to you, but we can definitely send some links. But I think the GSBA website has a lot of, a lot of the links up already. Yeah, and the SBA um, also has a ton of information and, and links and all of this stuff is new and it should be rolling out um, this week. Right. So I can't give you an exact day or time, but um, this this week, I think you should be able to start applying for it. I had a client yesterday that applied for the $10,000 grant already, applied for this SBA loan part of the CARES Act, 
and he was like applicant number 38 million or something. I mean, it was a ridiculous number, but people are doing it already. This one that we're talking about with the employment relief though, like I said, my understanding is it's, it's gonna be available this week. But again, this is all new. All of us are, we're, we're learning this together. Definitely, thank you for the GSBA plug. You know, we've been uh, working very diligently to make sure that our uh, COVID-19 emergency resource page is um, continually up to date uh, with information to make sure that everyone is staying healthy and staying in business um, and finding opportunities to to welcome people to uh, to their business as well. So it's it's a great resource. Um, you can find it on our website, uh, the GSBA.org. Um, so definitely utilize that the best you can. Um, I know we touched a little bit about insurance before. There was a question uh, when reaching out to our business insurance, uh, what questions should we be asking? First, make sure you have your policy. Um, a lot of people don't have their policies. If you have your policy, you can typically take a pretty good look at it. These brokers, so a lot of times people just go right to their broker and they ask their brokers. A lot of these brokers aren't very knowledgeable on the policy. They're, they're knowledgeable on the rates, right? Um, and so, you know, when people will step back, when people are getting insurance, you have to find a good broker. You have to find the insurance that's right and that covers everything. Um, we do a lot of litigation in our office. And a lot of times the insurance companies are paying for our litigation fees. Like they are paying for everything minus a small amount of money that the client has to pay. Other times when somebody has a, a inexpensive insurance policy that doesn't quite cover everything, they're pay paying for it out of their pocket. So there is questions that they want to ask. I mean, they would want to ask one, and again, the broker or the person they're talking to may not have this information, but they want to ask one, am I covered for relief um, for my business employees, for lost profits, everything else that's going on from COVID-19. And I know there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of litigation on this already. And I think the insurance companies are just trying to deny. They're trying to deny everything from what I'm reading anyway, but it doesn't mean that they're, they're able to deny everything. Um, they can they can straight up deny it. However, there still be may, still may be some coverage there. So the broker is a good way to start, but typically they're not going to know everything. The broker can tell you who your insurance company is. You may have a resource to them. I think they're pretty much backlogged. But getting a copy of the policy, reviewing it themselves, and then if they need help, going to an attorney and having an attorney help review that with them. Yes, and um, real quick, just. The full policy, not just the right. not yes. just the cover, not the declaration page, everything. You need the policy that has all the definitions, terms, and conditions. Yes, thank you. The chat box is on fire, which is great. Um, so lots of questions are coming in. So we want to make sure that we're able to get to everybody um, as quickly as we can. Um, Toria, uh, I know it's been scrolling along. Is there another question that's that's popped up that I haven't had a chance to peek at yet? Yeah, we received a, a question about a specific person that had a business employees of over 100 and um, they have on-call on staff and 28 full-time. When applying for uh, the PPP and other grant loans, how do they determine the number of employees when this is asked? Convert on-call to a full-time ratio or something into that scenario could you help with that there was i think they had the uh they had clarification on how you do that on the, on the cares act yeah so um especially with you know cheerleading again with the cares act they the sba has um or excuse me the department of commerce had a uh like a little four page pamphlet that goes through it and it has actually how you how you calculate stuff and so anytime that there's going to be anything that uh, relates to eligibility or, or counts, that's going to be specified um, within the program, within the text of it, whether it's the statute or, or the rules and regulations that the, administ um, that the department rolls out. And it's part of the depart, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You can go on their website and they have links to everything. Um, I do know with the payroll act that we were talking about, um, I think it's 500 employees or less. So even if they would had 100 full-time employees, it sounds like they would like to qualify for this. But it does set forth the calculations um, on that little checklist that, that Jake just held up there. Um, and it tells you how to do the calculations. It's, it's four pages. It's very, very self-explanatory. But it... Um... Yeah, so with whatever program it is, it's going to dictate specifically how how to do the count. 
typically what I've seen though is that the um, even part-time employees are counted as an employee and it's the payroll expense, their, their salary is the number that really matters for the amount that you can borrow. Is there any considerations that should go into play if you have uh, 28 full-time employees and six are still working at share work 20 hours a week? Um, considerations in like in what regard? Uh, would they be considered uh, in the calculation as um, a part-time or full-time employee? Is there anything that should be separated? Well, most likely it'd be considered full-time employees and um, one of the things that these uh, these laws do is they don't just take the the immediate snapshot of what things are today or what things are at the time that you applied. They they look back. Um, they're rear looking to see what the employment situation was back before all stay at home and other social distancing um, things were implemented. So we're going to have to kind of look back and do a um, do do sort of a forensic analysis of what the business was, see how that fits into the framework of whichever program you're looking at, um, and then make the calculations as dictated by that program. Another payroll question uh, that came in uh, from Natalie. I have a catering business and want to exist after COVID. Um, I have maintained some work for my employees and trying to manage finances um, so that I can last for a few months. Um, I have stopped paying my uh, paying myself, but now that I care payroll uh, may be forgiven with the CARES Act, I wonder if I should continue paying myself via regular payroll. Probably. I, it, it, I mean, it really, it's going to depend on, on um, your particular circumstances and um, you know, so it just depends on the amount of business that you're getting and what your liabilities are, what your cash reserves are, and again, how you prioritize things and whether or not you're going to put, if you have the cash reserves in order to, um, sustain, uh, your, your livelihood while you're not paying yourself. Um, you know, that's an, a personal analysis that you have to determine whether or not it makes sense for you um, to be paying other people while you're not being paid yourself. And even hypothetically, even if there isn't the funds to pay yourself, um, I would still say cut yourself that check. Um, it doesn't have to be cash, but make sure you're still taking care of it so that if and when it, it is able to be taken care of, you can cash those checks and it should be on the books. Um, a lot of times I think the mistake or just downfall of small businesses is they feel that <clears throat> they have to pay everybody else first, including vendors and, and landlords and, and everything else, and then not pay themselves or just funnel money from their own personal funds into the business. Um, I try to get my clients pretty early on, whether it's $1,000 a month, $3,000 a month, $5,000 a month, make sure that you are part of that payroll. And then if there's money left over at the end, you talk to your accountant and then you, depending on what sort of business it is, then you're going to have other income sources like K1 or whatever it may be, but get some sort of a minimal amount that you're going to have as payroll. And then everything else can be just sort of profits from that business when there is extra money there. But yeah, the, the owner's payroll is part of this, this um, payroll cost of the, the right. CARES Act. Terry, it looks like there was a question from James Bart. Yes, what are independent contractors to do when they're laid off? Are there any options? Is there a loan or grant options for this scenario? So I think, again, if we're talking about the CARES Act um, and the new one, I think part of the unemployment yeah. portion of that is independent contractors are going to be able to apply for unemployment benefits. Um, and I think there's also loans. I don't know how the, the screen just changed again. Can you see us? Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, so there is provisions in there for independent contractors. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of real estate brokers are, are asking the same sort of things. Um, you know, a lot of the oh my goodness, the the tech. delivery people and the tech yeah. people. Um, it's the same sort sort of thing, but they are, from my understanding and the reading of it, they are going to be covered from this. So normally, prior to this, they would have a lot of these independent contractors would not have been able to get unemployment, um, and now they are. 
We did have another question. Um, are the Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan uh, mutually uh, exclusive or can a business receive both? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a question that stumps us right now. Yeah. Um, we'd have to do a little bit more uh, reading, but uh, I think that you could probably get both. I don't know. At, at this point. I do know that on a lot of the applications it asks, have you applied for something else? And maybe there is or isn't qualifications. Um, but again, it's new. Um, we'll, we'll have to go back and look at that. So that's a good question. We are just funneling through the questions right now. Terea, is there an additional question that you might be uh, ready to ask? Yes. Um, what happens if I'm self-employed as a hairdresser? Do I qualify for the grant to help me through this crisis? Uh, for unemployment benefits? If it's for unemployment benefits, I believe they are covered. If it's for like a small business, um, I don't know the answer to that one. But I do know for unemployment benefits, the answer is most likely yes, they're going to be able to get the unemployment. Um, I know, so we have a, in, in our building that we have here, um, I know the owner of the business was eligible for this. I, I'm just not sure with his hairdressers. So there's a lot of their independent contractors um, and I don't know whether they're gonna be able to get it. I do know that they do qualify for the grants. Um, so the independent contractors that are the hairdressers down at the salon below us, um, they would be able to apply for these grants. And since Amazon is right next door, they would likely be able to get those sort of grants as to this this loan for the payroll, um, I'm not 100% positive. Jake, do you remember reading something about that in the in the CARES Act? Yeah. So, I, you know, again, I'd suggest that you guys all um, look for the short PDF. It's just this four pager, um, and print it out. This is what the page one looks like. Uh, on page three of that, it discusses the the payroll uh, costs and how much you can get, and it is available to both employees and independent contractors or sole proprietors, individuals. The amount though that for salary that whether it's an employee or an independent contractor or sole proprietor, it's a hundred thousand dollars is is the salary cap um, per year. So it's gonna be prorated off of that two and a half months. Okay, perfect. but yeah, as far, as far as that goes, and you know, we'll call it. A, maybe it's throwing us off a bit. Like it is a loan um, that is forgivable. So in a sense, it's it's a uh, you know a potential grant. grant um, but you have to meet the cert the criteria for the for forgiveness, and those are specified in the statute. And I think as an independent contractor, I think it contractor, I think it should be relatively easy to meet those. Yeah. And then and also I, I, they're asking for like a hardship and I think that's going to be pretty easy as well because they're not able to work at this particular point. We are all going to have some wonderful hair when this thing is over, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I have nonstop wonderful watching people get their own haircuts at home. And I'm telling oh you, my I goodness. think <laughs> we, need to, we need to talk to the governor about essential employees <laughs> and make sure hairdressers are on there. <laughs> So we have time for just a few more questions. I know they're still uh, funneling in, so I want to make sure that we're, we're cognizant of everybody's time. Um, a quick one that just kind of harkens back to what we were speaking about earlier. Um, it's a follow-up uh, on hiring an attorney. Yes. Um, relatively basic question. Um, uh, the individual literally called up and said, hi, I think I need an attorney. Um, and is there a process? Uh, they tried to, to do this last year uh, when forming their business and received uh, the response that they were too early uh, and to need a lawyer and then uh, needed one to look at, uh, at their lease and were told it was they were too late. Um, it was incredibly <laughs> frustrating. Um, they don't know how, how uh, a lawyer even uh, to be able to assist them. Um, how can you break it down uh, to really simple steps? Yeah, I mean, again, like Jake says, there's, there's going to be good fits and good matches between a potential client and a potential lawyer. So, you know, referrals are a great source to find an attorney. So if, if somebody has a friend that helped them with their small business um, to help form that small business and, and negotiate leases and things, that attorney is probably gonna be a decent fit for somebody that's doing the same thing. 
like our office, we will we will never say it's too early to have an attorney. Okay, it's never too early. It's never too late. It's it's correct. It's never too early. Never too late. Being late creates challenges, um, but being early typically does not create challenges. All it does is create some good communication streams and build that relationship. So hypothetically, they emailed or called our office. We would have scheduled them in. We'd have done some communications with them, talked about the process, and we do this all the time. So, you know, we are we are across the street from this Amazon building. A lot of the employees come over here because they want to start up their own little businesses, their side projects, and they come to us before they've done anything, right? And they come to us and we discuss it. We discuss how they can get funds. We discuss the things that they need to look for and, and the agreements that they're going to have to have. Then they come back. They have their other potential members with them. We communicate with them, again, knowing that we're going to represent the business, not the individuals. Um, then we draft up documents for them. So I, I'd say it's it's never too early. So the attorney that said that it was too early may not have been a good fit for that particular client. Um, and just to, to touch on that, one of the things that we would do um, from the beginning is talking about the goals. Yeah. Always talking about the goals. And it would depend on, you know, that'd be a great time to find out whether or not it's the potential client's goal to own and operate this business long term and use it as a source of retirement or is it something that they want to start up put their energy into it for several years and then sell it right hoping to make a big profit and then move on to the next project um as far as you know hey if even if you already signed the lease it's not too late if you don't understand what's in it you know it's not it's never too late to to gain that understanding right. and again that could help with Hey, if you want to, if you want to do it long term, is this lease, you know, a great fit? Is this landlord a great fit for your long term plan, or, you know, maybe it's time to look someplace else. Start start your search for a new um, new space. So it's ne it's never too late, even if it hit the fan and somebody has a judgment against them. You know, it's never too late to meet somebody like Justin that can help them decide what to do and how to whether or not to pay this judgment off whether or not to hold up a business or um protect assets it's you know it's never too early it's never too late it's just that the time is now it's whenever you think like oh i'm gonna do something i maybe i should talk to a lawyer yes yes you probably should and to piggyback that like jake said um if you have a business even if you don't need any legal representation tickle them on a yearly basis just like you go to your doctor on a yearly basis um, if it's an individual you know and they just want their insurance policies looked at I mean we've done that we have clients that come to us for anything we've had clients that came to us to help them apply for Social Security benefits right because they just didn't know what they were doing or people people have their jobs they don't have time to do certain things so they're just like just do this help me with my loan closing on my real property I don't want to do anything or I can do it, but I just don't understand it. I'm an engineer. And so we'll go through all the loan documents with them. We'll help them through the escrow process. I mean, attorneys have their place. And I, and I feel that a lot of people don't take advantage of that until it's too late when they have to be more reactive. And then it costs double and triple the money um, than if they were proactive. And again, it's never too late. It's just suboptimal. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, one of the final questions we have is, uh, which specific grants can an independent contractor apply for? So the, back to the CARES Act and this little brochure that Jake has held up a couple times from the US Chamber of Commerce. Um, if you could hold it up one, one more time too, people are really yeah, interested definitely. in that. And I, we could send the link as well, but I mean, this is, this is the first page of it, okay? And it's, it's a four page document. Right. I don't know if you can see all this, but it's a four page document and it talks about independent contractors specifically. It talks about um, small businesses. It talks about the caps, the limits, um, you know, how many employees, what can be covered, et cetera. So this is a great one. Um, again, this is the one that is not quite available yet, but it should be this week. The SBA loans, um, the old SBA loans were very difficult to get. Um, I wasn't a huge advocate for SBA loans because they cross collateralized everything. They required a guarantee, et cetera. Some of the new ones out there don't. 
this you know, yeah this yeah, disaster no, relief is, no guarantee is no cross collateralization forgiveness i mean these are wonderful things um again the amazon grant here the small business one that seattle is putting on there's a bunch of them that are out there that that independent contractors and individuals um, would be able to qualify for and you can go online and they have the application process and it'll ask you are you an independent contractor yes and then you fill out the rest of the paperwork we're almost out of time, so I don't know if you wanted, either of you wanted to just take a quick second to leave us with any final words of wisdom or encouragement or that last bit of strategy for us to, you know, to keep moving forward. I mean, I think the encouragement is, like Jake said, just, just hit the pause button a little bit if you can. Um, these are trying times for everybody. Like, everybody is going through this. This is not a Seattle thing. This is not a Washington thing. This is not a United States thing. This is a global thing. And we are all going through this together. And so there is resources that, I mean, what, $2 trillion? This is, I mean, this is on $2 trillion um, in relief that's out there. Mortgage companies are now getting lines of credit because the mortgage companies were, were having to pause refinances. Um, and now they're able to do refinances again. So cash out refinances are wonderful opportunities as well. But, you know, if there is an issue, talk to the right people, typically attorneys, your insurance broker, accountants, those are going to be the people that can put you in the right direction. And we don't do all areas of practice at our firm. Um, and so we can refer you off to others. So hypothetically, somebody comes to us and they're like, hey, I need help with a DUI or I need help with, you know, an employment rights case. We'll say, okay, great. We're not a great fit, but here's a great attorney that can help you. So we'd love to be a resource for whatever legal needs that somebody needs, even if it's something that we don't cover. Yeah. And I, I'd say, you know, the most important thing, um, you know, talking to the right people and it's just talking and, you know, even like this stuff is stressful. So even if it's not talking to accountants or other professionals, just talk to people. You know, if you're, you're getting depressed or, or anxious about this, make sure that you talk about it, talk to somebody, don't bottle it up. Um, because this is hard and we have to take care of ourselves and take care of each other. So just, you know, talk and we're all going to, we're going to get through this. And feel free. I don't know if, if our emails are on there, but if you want to put our emails on there, like I said, we're responding, we're still working. We're working typically virtually right now. Um, we've done quite a few zoom meetings um, and then just a lot of telephonic meetings, but we are all available. Our offices aren't closed. Um, most, of the businesses in our building, they they say they're closed, but they're not closed. You can still get a hold of people. So the businesses are still running, mostly the essential ones anyway, um, and they're all running virtually. So if there is questions after this, by all means, feel free to reach out to us and, and, and we'll set something up and discuss it with you. That's great. Yeah, we have all of your contact information is actually uh, on the screen right now. Uh, we just want to make sure that everybody who is is joining us, um, you know, if you are looking for a great attorney, uh, you can also visit a GSBA online directory. Um, there's uh, there's help and listings there for, for you as well. Um, you know, on behalf of GSBA, we'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us today. Um, additional thank you to, to both you, Justin and Jacob, for, for sharing your strategies during uh, COVID-19. And um, of course, a, a big thank you to uh, Integrity Law Group. Um, if you uh, have any follow-up questions, uh, like it's been said, uh, please definitely reach out to Integrity Law Group directly. Check out our uh, GSBA uh, listings guide uh, for assistance there, um, or your GSBA membership team. We're here to help as well. So if you have any questions, you can always follow up with us. Um, do be sure to continue to visit uh, the GSBA COVID-19 emergency resource page. Um, it's continually being up to date. Um, so it's, there's some amazing information there. You should really check it out. Our next uh, GSBA rapid response uh, will be next Tuesday, uh, April 7th. Um, it'll take place at 10 a.m. Uh, our professional guest that day will be Jordy Neff uh, from Rain City CPA. Um, so until then, uh, we hope everybody just stays home and, and stays healthy. Thank you so much.